Good morning, church family. I'm Pastor Eric Borchers from Our Savior Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas. Welcome from my home to yours. Our text for today's message comes to us by way of a few weeks ago when we heard that a man was born blind and then Jesus subsequently healed him. The Jews, and and when I say Jews, I'm referring to Pharisees for the context of today's message. The Jews had agreed that if any man confessed Jesus as Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. Essentially, this is excommunication. And it means that a person would be isolated, not only religiously, but in every way. And it was such a frightening prospect that even the parents of the man born blind ended up dodging the questions from the Jewish leaders. And they referred him back to their son so that he could answer the questions. The son not only refused to agree that Jesus was a sinner, but also challenged the Pharisees with his answers. The Jews responded as the Jews would have responded. They drove him out, presumably meaning excommunication. He was separated, cut off from everything that was community for him. This sort of uncaring action is characteristic, really, not of a shepherd who cares for the flock, but as a thief or a robber who cares nothing for the sheep. And the irony is that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, They thought that they understood everything. They failed to see the significance of all Jesus had done. Their hearts were closed off to him, so they missed this plain-as-day truth that was right in front of their eyes. And there are so many, truly, not specific religious leaders, but there are so many who don't see Jesus for who he is because they have already closed off their hearts, they've hardened their hearts, And so they can't see the truth that is coming to them from so many different places. They had already made up their minds of what they thought they knew. With that, let's listen to our sermon for our our text for the day. The Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, That man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Often we refer to our pastors as shepherds. You know, there are plenty of passages that support this. John 21, Acts 20, 1 Peter 5. But John 10 doesn't. It goes in a different direction. Verses 11 through 18 that go a little beyond our gospel reading for the day emphasize the Christological nature of this passage and truly the inappropriateness of applying its imagery to anyone but Christ himself. Let me read verses 11 through 18 of chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not yet of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. 
For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay my life down that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. In verse 1, Jesus begins with the words, truly, truly. In the Greek, it actually is a word, amen. Amen, amen. You probably can hear it. Amen, amen. This is most certainly true, which is why Jesus says, truly, truly, I tell you. The word amen, it expresses a strong affirmation of that which is being said or that which has just been said. The truly, truly occurs 23 times in the Gospel of John, and it's provided with great emphasis. He always seems, Jesus does, to be linking it, using it to link a, a prior story that has happened to, to what is about to happen or what he is currently teaching. The prior story in this case I've already revealed to you is the man born blind. So this good shepherd teaching grows out of the story where the Pharisees were anything but good shepherds because they weren't caring for the people. Jesus said, if you come in another way, you're like a thief and a robber. Now I'm going to take this verse by verse because I think that if you're not familiar with this particular passage, you could easily be distracted by all of the different metaphors that Jesus is using here. But he said, if you come in another way, you're like a thief or a robber. He's basically saying there's only one way in. You'll see that in a moment. This brings to mind really Ezekiel 34, where God rebukes the shepherds of Israel who were feeding themselves before they were taking care of their flocks. God stopped their exploitation, and he took on the role himself as shepherd. Much the same thing happens in Jeremiah 23. And then in the Old Testament, there are a number of references to God as shepherd and to the people as the flock. I want you to look these passages up on your, on your own time, but I give them to you for your edification. Psalm 23.1, that's right in our bulletin for today. Psalm 77.20, 79.13, 80 verse 1, 95 verse 7, 100 verse 3, and Isaiah 40 verse 11. Now, much of Judea is poor, rocky soil, and usually that's better suited for kind of grazing than it is cultivation of, of crops. So shepherding really was a, a very common occupation. The collection of wool was important. So shepherds sometimes would work with the same sheep over and over, year after year, so that they could develop a process, so that they could develop a strong relationship with them. After all, the whole point of today is my sheep hear my voice, right? Jesus said the shepherd enters through the gate and the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. Now, a solitary shepherd watching over a small flock in all likelihood wouldn't ever encounter a gatekeeper. So I think what's being pictured here is a large sheepfold that's capable of holding multiple flocks, many sheep. And, and the gatekeeper recognizes the shepherd as he's coming and then opens the gate for him. The shepherd would use a, a distinctive call so that his sheep would recognize him and then they would gather around him. Jesus said, he calls his own sheep by name. Guys, this is important to me because I think what's Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is that the relationship is personal. Those words, his own, reflect the very personal nature of the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. And in that culture, people considered a person's name to be more than just a simple identifier that said this person was different from that person. They believed that something of a person's identity was tied up in the name. And so that name expressed something of the person's essential character. The point of this verse is that the good shepherd knows the sheep with a deep, enduring relationship. And it reminds me of the text early on that tells us that he knew our name from the beginning of time. He counted the hairs on our head. And it's also noteworthy to bring up John chapter 20, verse 16, where Mary Magdalene recognizes the risen Christ 
but only after he calls her by name. That's pretty cool because it means that there was a personal relationship there. Now, when I was serving as a missionary in Mexico, I helped to tend the livestock of the eldest son and their family that I was staying with. Many of the village farmers had sheep. Each day, all of the farmers, and I'll refer to them in a moment as shepherds, but all of the farmers took their flock to the watering hole, and it seemed like they all sort of converged in the same spot at roughly the same time. And as you might well imagine, the flocks got intermixed. Having grown up working cattle, oftentimes uh, on foot, but I was on a horse here in Mexico, and I was excited for what came next. I was excited because I was ready to cut the flocks apart with my horse, to allow the horse to do that work. Um, but to my surprise, that's not at all what happened. I thought I knew what was coming, but I didn't. Because each shepherd called out. They called out with a whistle, with a clap, with their own unique kind of grunt or sound. And eventually, the flocks, after hearing that time and time again, they would back away from the watering hole and they would kind of separate and they would all meander over to their shepherd. And then I recalled watching my grandfather as I was growing up and he would call the cattle into, into the pen. Um, he would call them with a very common phrase. I, I've said it before in, in a different message, uh, but I'll do it for you here. He'd say, come on, suck, 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 suck. I always thought that was a little strange, but then I looked and there is a, a Scottish word, souk, S-O-O-K. And so what he was really saying was, come on, souk, 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 souk. It's a real word. Look it up. It actually is a Scottish call for cattle or for sheep. Jesus said, and he leads them out. I think this is pretty neat too, because while they're inside the sheepfold, they have some incredible protection because of the walls. From all that is outside that might harm them, they're protected. But when the shepherd leads them out of the sheepfold, the shepherd is their only protection. And it's the only protection that they would have needed if their shepherd wasn't true shepherd, was truly their protector. Jesus said he goes out before them and they follow him because he knows because they know his voice. And Psalm 23 comes to mind here. It brings Psalm 23 into perfect focus, really. You know the words. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Jesus went out before them. The shepherd went out before them because they know his voice and because he is their protector. See, once the sheep have recognized the shepherd's call and have separated themselves from all the other flocks gathered around, then he leads them out. He takes them out of the sheepfold into the pasture beside the still or the quiet waters. He leads them rather than drives them. He goes ahead of them to ensure the path is safe. And he repeats his call periodically. Again, I can hear my grandfather's call talking to the sheep as they went along. And they recognize his voice and they follow him. But they won't follow a stranger. No, when a stranger calls out, they're going to flee. They're going to go and scatter in different directions. Why? Because they've learned to trust their shepherd. And that's why they follow. The Pharisees didn't and they couldn't understand because they thought of themselves as the good shepherds. It would have been nearly impossible for them to imagine that Jesus would portray them as bad shepherds, as thieves. Or robbers. Since they didn't understand what he said to them the first time, now Jesus changes it up a little bit. He says, I am the sheep door. He changes the metaphor. A moment ago, he was having the gate open for them and he was the shepherd, but now he's saying, I am the sheep's door. He was the shepherd, but now he's the gate. The villages around the area that we're talking about usually would have had some pretty large communal sheepfolds with a strong door. But in some places, most likely the places that were out in the wilderness and the wild as they were uh, walking and grazing, and they had to bed down for the night, they would find a, a rocky outcropping maybe that butted up against the side of a, a hill or a mountain or a cliff. And they would all, the sheep would all go into that area. 
The shepherd, though, because there was no gate, because they were out in the wilderness, would make his bed in the opening. He would lie down, block the opening with his body, and protect the sheep with his own life. See, he is the door, literally, to the sheepfold. And for us, Jesus is the gate or the door. He is the one who laid down his life to save us in order to get us to the Father in heaven. In order to get there, we must believe and trust in Jesus. We must follow him. The only way to the Father is through the Son. Now notice that Jesus doesn't say that he is a door, but instead he says he is the door. Later, he'll say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. And it's unfortunately popular today that people will believe that there are many equally valid doors that lead to the Father in heaven, lead to God, ultimately. The truth is, though, this verse suggests otherwise. I am the way. I am the truth, Jesus said. No one comes to the Father except through me. Guys, there aren't many ways up the mountain to heaven. There's only one way, and it's through belief in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. That is the purpose, really. That's the purpose of the sheepfold, the, to provide a safe haven in a dangerous world. It provides the sheep from the thieves and the predators, and it saves them, saves us, from our own foolishness. Jesus said, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. The thief only is satisfying his own needs and cares little about the welfare of others. You see how this is coming full circle from what the Pharisees did with the man born blind at the beginning? Jesus warns of false prophets and antichrists in Scripture and savage wolves who will not spare the flock, some who will live as the enemy of the cross, and some of those may even be right in the midst of your own church. Even in the church, in the world today, today sometimes the church suffers from some of its own pastors some I've even seen as televangelists who are promising wealth to the sheep, but are really just reaping wealth and benefits for themselves. All these are thieves and robbers who steal and kill and destroy, who steal that which doesn't belong to them, who kill the trust of those who believed in them, who destroy the faith of the little ones. And Scripture clearly says it would be better for one of these who causes my little ones to stumble to have a millstone hung around their neck and drowned in the sea. Pastors, if you're listening to this today, we who are entrusted with the word and the sacraments, we need always to remember that the devil whom Jesus calls the murderer, the great liar and deceiver, works especially hard to bring us down. Because by bringing us as pastors down, he is able to cause those little ones, those who, we are, who are put in our care to shepherd, I'll use that word, to shepherd, um, it can cause their faith to stumble. We must always be on guard against temptation, lest we find ourselves numbered among the thieves and the robbers which Jesus is speaking of. And we must, in an earthly shepherding kind of way, as an under-shepherd, as pastors, we must watch over the sheep in our care. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking about someone else in the church, someone from outside the church. If we're talking about the very situation that we find ourselves in right now with this whole uh, coronavirus, it's important that we care for people. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. See, unlike the thief, Jesus is focused on the welfare of the sheep, coming and going. Jesus promises to protect and provide for his sheep. He says, they have life and they have it abundantly. Dear fellow sheep, if you want to experience truly life to its fullest and your faith to its fullest, we must hear our shepherd's voice. 
We must follow it. We must live our day to day asking questions like, what would Jesus have me do? Who would he have me talk to or interact with? How would he respond to this or that particular circumstantial situation? As we bring our lives into compliance and under Jesus's will, he blesses us. And he does that with abundant life. Not to twist the scripture, don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean necessarily with abundant life you'll have health or even wealth. It just means abundance, which has really more to do with where our heart is than what's in our hands. Don't ever forget, Jesus came into this world to live and to die and to rise that we would have abundant faith. Dear friends, you who follow him, who are listening to this today, you are his forgiven and his redeemed children, both now and forevermore. Amen. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise your name. We love you, Lord. We know that you're in charge of all things. Today I ask that you would help us to hear your voice, that you would help us to follow you when we hear it. And I know, Lord, Sometimes the way that you speak to us is varying. You speak to us through your word. You speak to us in the quiet of prayer. You speak to us through music. You speak to us through a word spoken in truth and love from a brother or sister. You speak to us, Lord, but you do it all the time. Help us to open our hearts and our ears and our mind that we might truly follow you and know you. Father, I pray that you would be with all of those who are feeling isolated and alone at this time. It's very important, Lord, that we understand that you haven't left us. And I pray that you would strengthen every one of your children, that you would strengthen every one that you have placed in my care as pastor. I ask, Lord, for your love and mercy to rest on us for us to all have the peace that passes all understanding. And for us to all be aware that even though we are separated from one another physically right now, spiritually, we are together with one another in you. We bless your name, Lord. We pray for our government, both our federal government, our state government. We pray for those who are making decisions I pray, Lord, for myself as pastor and the elders working through the process of what happens next for our Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would give us all peace and that you would protect us and guide us with the wisdom that can only come from you. We bless your name, Lord, and in all these things we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And all God's people said, Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.